the Great Wall of China, the largest structure ever built, and one of the world's great icons. We're going to follow it on foot. We'll walk across burning deserts, climb high into the mountains, and venture into China's furthest, most inhospitable reaches. We'll meet the people who live and work along the most remote but perhaps the most romantic stretch of the wall. This is the China the tourist rarely sees. The China of ancient tradition. We'll get to the heart of it on Walking the World. For the Chinese, the Great Wall is the symbol of national identity. It's everywhere you look. It's on t-shirts and stamps. It's on every tourist visa. It's the symbol of the national police force. The Great Wall pickup is China's most popular brand. The Great Wall lies at the very heart of Chinese culture. For centuries, it defined the nation's borders. The people inside it were the Han Chinese. Those beyond it, the challenging outsiders. It's not just the Chinese who are fascinated by the Great Wall. It's a major international attraction. Here at the wall's most well-known section, at Badaling, just outside Beijing, Thousands of tourists come every day. For the visitors, this is the very essence of the Great Wall. Except it's not. It's a fake, a reconstruction built in the 1960s as part of Mao Zedong's campaign to boost Chinese pride. The real wall, as we shall see, doesn't look like this at all. And there are other myths about the Great Wall. For one thing, you can't see the wall from space, at least not with the unaided eye. In October 2003, China's first astronaut, Yang Liwei, announced, the Earth looked very beautiful from space, but I did not see our Great Wall. For another thing, there's not one single continuous wall. The Great Wall is in fact a series of barriers built up over 2,000 years in many different places. Nobody can say just how long the Great Wall is. New sections are still being discovered. So far, a total of nearly four and a half thousand miles of wall have been identified. Now that's a long walk, though some have done it. But we're going to walk a single section, one of the oldest, remotest, and least visited. It's also one of the most challenging. This is a walk for people prepared to take a risk and who really like it hot and dry. Our inspiration is Xuanzang, a 7th century scholar who walked the length of the ancient Silk Road in search of Buddhist scriptures from India. He was the origin of the famous monkey legend. Stories describing his adventures with his companions, Brother Sand, the river monster, Pigface, the glutton cast out from heaven, the Dragon King transformed into a horse, and of course, Monkey, the trickster. But the real Xuanzang walked alone for thousands of miles in the shelter of the Great Wall, and were following in his footsteps, or some of them at least. We've come to Lanzhou, a large vibrant city that straddles the Yellow River. 
It's a chance to get acclimated to the heat and to absorb the unique atmosphere of this part of China. For a walk this challenging, we're going to need supplies. And down a side street, we find a market. It's not immediately obvious what everything is. There are all sorts of fruits and vegetables. Pastries that might be sweet or savory. And they're all being sold at the tops of their voices in the local Gansu dialect. There are even potato chips. And crowding into the market a wide variety of people, including the Muslim minorities who live all along the Silk Road. Along the riverbank, there's an unexpected sight, an ancient feat of engineering that once made the city possible by bringing life to this arid land. These giant water wheels more than 30 feet high are all that remain. More than 250 once lined the river's edge, extracting water from the mighty river to irrigate the parched soils. Now the job is done by electric pumps but the skills that created the wheels are still alive in craftsmen like Deng Hua, who look after the remaining wheels and make small replicas as souvenirs. Just along the river, what looks like a panel of blow-up pigs turns out to be a sheepskin raft. New Chang is one of the few remaining Yellow River raftsmen. But there's no time for a ride. It's time to leave Lanzhou and meet the first real challenge of our walk. Tomorrow, we'll be heading out into the desert. We'll get our first sight of the oldest section of the Great Wall. And from now on, water so plentiful here will be our biggest luxury. In the second leg of our Great Wall Walk, we're striking out in the footsteps of the great walker, Xuanzang. Our route takes us across the Tengger Desert to the great Silk Road cities beyond. It seems an unpromising start, but this small area of marshland is where the trail begins. And this is our first glimpse of the real, original Great Wall of China. It's a world away from the tourist site back near Beijing. This is what remains of the high walls built 2,000 years ago to keep out the invaders from Mongolia. There has been no attempt to restore or even preserve it. The trail through the marsh is a gentle beginning, but just beyond lies the desert, and that's a different matter. In the shifting sands of the desert, there's no clear trail. In places, the wall itself is all but buried. We have to pick out a path for ourselves, staying as close to the wall as possible. Fortunately, the towers that punctuated the wall still reach above the sands, marking out the route as the wall marches ahead. It's early summer and the heat Dryness and dust of the desert are almost overwhelming. It's hard to believe anything can survive here, but life is all around. Further into the desert, the sand dunes reach up to 30 feet high. This is the classic desert landscape. To walk through it is an unforgettable experience. A string of camels completes the picture. 
Once this was the only way for Chinese merchants to trade with Central Asia and Europe beyond. Protected by the Great Wall, they took silk, jade, and porcelain along the winding trail, returning with gold, ivory, and jewels. The camels carried the precious goods, while the traders walked alongside. But this isn't a real camel train. For hidden between the dunes is a visitor center where more adventurous tourists come for a taste of the desert. These are Bactrian camels with two humps. They're native to this part of China, although in 2002 there were just 950 of them roaming wild. They're well adapted for this dramatic climate. At some 4,000 feet above sea level, the winters here are brutal. With average temperatures of minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit. The camels grow a shaggy coat to protect them. Then as temperatures soar in summer, the winter coat drops away, leaving the camels looking somewhat mothy. As we walk, the scenery is gradually changing. Seeking refuge from the heat, we head for a Buddhist temple built right onto the Great Wall as a resting place for travelers. Next to it, a shepherd has brought his sheep into a small patch of shade. Around us, the sand dunes are giving way to stones and scrub. There are small hillocks scattered across the landscape. According to the shepherd, they're the graves of local people his kinsmen, who by custom are buried out in the desert. After miles in the parched desert, there's only one thing a desert walker really longs for. A break from the trail in a green, lush oasis seems heaven sent. To a Silk Road traveler, a thousand years ago, it would have been literally a lifeline. Today, the year-round natural water supply supports a large and thriving community. We head for the ancient city of Wuwei, guarded by a massive city gate. There's not much sign of the traditional city. China's economic boom has reached even this far into the desert. We're arriving on a Saturday afternoon. The town square is where everyone gets together. There's a market, selling everything from insect spray to motor scooters. The giant statue is a familiar symbol throughout China. But it has a special significance here. The original 2,000-year-old statuette was found in Wu Wei. For lunch, we've come to a specialty food market in search of a local variation on a Chinese favorite, hand-stretched noodles. Madam Sun and her well-drilled team are producing what's known as the three-package meal. It's part cooking, part theater. Somehow, the noodles never, ever touch the ground. The noodles go into a soup. Part two of the package is a plate of sliced meat. And 
part three, the tea that goes with it. While the others prepare the meals, Madam Sun encourages customers to come to her all-woman stall. It's better than the competition, she says. They're pretty much all men, and what do they know about cooking? The legend goes that Marco Polo, on his travels along the Silk Road, discovered these noodles and took them back to Italy, where they called them spaghetti. And if the three-package meal doesn't appeal, you can always take your meat in a sandwich, a burger, Gansu style. Gansu has more surprises. At the end of this nondescript street is a gateway leading to a hidden treasure, the Haizang Buddhist Temple. A painting here commemorates Xuanzang, who passed through here 14 centuries ago on his epic walk to India. It's said that he spent a whole year here, and it's easy to see why. The temple, with its well-tended grounds, is still a haven of peace within the busy modern city, an oasis within the oasis. Just walking around the temple grounds is itself a meditation. Towards the back, a group of craftsmen is using a traditional method to restore the temple. First, the most junior apprentice, a boy of around 13, lays down the base colors. Then the senior apprentice fills in the rough shapes. Finally, the master paints in the details. This is how it's been done for hundreds of years. For the painters, it's a form of devotion in itself. At the highest point of the temple, there's a well. According to legend, the water comes straight from the holy city of Lhasa in Tibet. It is believed to grant blessings to those who drink it. Anyone is welcome to drink, as the monks themselves do every day. For us, the oasis can be just a brief stopover. Tomorrow, we'll be following the trail onwards through a stunning mountain corridor and for the first time, glimpse the true scale of the mighty wall. Leaving the oasis city of Wu Wei, we follow the great wall upwards into one of its most magnificent stretches the Hushi Corridor. It's a sliver of China squeezed between the high plateaus of Tibet and Mongolia. The wall still has gaps, but here we begin to grasp its scale. And a first idea of how it would have looked 23 centuries ago. It marches straight down the middle of the corridor protecting the Han Chinese farmers from the nomadic Shanggu tribes who threatened them and their trade. Close up, we can see how effective this massive barrier would have been. The wall reaches up to 20 feet high and is almost 10 feet thick, and it's made of nothing more than the surrounding earth. Soil that has been compressed to form a structure as hard as stone. During periods of peace, local people used sections of the wall to build their houses. They even made gateways to give their animals fresh grazing. Later, when danger threatened once more, the Ming Dynasty emperors repaired the wall. 
Most of what we see here dates from then, the 14th century. It feels as if time has stood still. But even here, the modern world is never far away. A new highway cuts straight through an ancient gateway within the wall. It's hard to believe these towers have been standing for centuries. They're made of nothing more than mud. The towers mark a transition. Beyond here lies one of the world's most extreme deserts, the legendary Gobi. It's the hottest and the coldest, and it's one of the highest. The Gobi is one of the greatest of walking challenges. Just looking out across its vast emptiness is awe-inspiring. Here, even the resilience of the Great Wall has been broken down by the extremes of the Gobi climate. Large sections have been eroded away. There will be places where following the wall's course will not be easy. Before we plunge further into the Gobi, we make a stop at the city of Zhanyi. Its bustling life is in stark contrast to the desert beyond. It's a mixture of influences like all the Silk Road cities. Effortlessly, Zhangyi blends ancient and modern. In the newest part of the city, people are doing traditional exercises, Tai Chi, Kung Fu, and other ancient martial arts. And while in the West, it's the young people out exercising, in China, it's the old. Marco Polo, the famous 13th century Italian traveler, spent time here, drawn by the promise of trade. There's still a flourishing market. But hidden behind, there's a circular doorway, and to step through it is to enter a different age. The old town of Shanyi has probably changed little since Marco Polo was here. People live much as they always have in the dusty houses built of desert soil. Round the corner, there's another glimpse of life on the ancient Silk Road a hostel for merchants and officials from the nearby province of Shanxi. There's even a theater, a distraction from the harshness of life with the camel trains. For us too, Shanyi has been a welcome rest. Tomorrow we take on the Gobi and make a detour to see a very unusual horse race. From Marco Polo Zhanyi, we'll be heading out along the Great Wall into the Gobi Desert. And we'll make a detour into the cooler air of the mountains. The section of wall we're following is one of the oldest, built and rebuilt from 100 BC right through to the 14th century. On and on it goes, guiding us through stunning, stark vistas. It looks harsh and utterly empty, but not far from here we'll discover that this is an illusion. We're making a detour to a nearby valley of the Chilean mountain range, where we'll see just how much life there is in this seemingly desolate landscape. As we walk uphill, the terrain changes. The going gets tougher as we go higher, the soil is poor. All that grows here is short steppe grass. 
but it's perfect for the hardy mountain sheep. Where there are sheep, there must be people, and soon they begin to appear. These are Uyghurs, members of one of China's smallest minority groups. For centuries, these rolling uplands have been their homeland. The Uyghur are no longer nomadic, but they still keep livestock, including yaks. Yak milk is a staple food for farming people. The milk is shared between the calves and the family. Yaks don't moo, they grunt. It just shows that these animals aren't exactly cows. One of the strongest Uyghur traditions is to welcome travelers. And we're invited into a tent in the pastures. The Uyghur make tea Tibetan style. It's not a casual affair. Yak milk is stewed with water and tea leaves. Then flour and yak butter are added. The farmer, Guo Chan Tai, and his family don't usually dress so elaborately. They're getting ready to go, like us, for a special day out. From Guo Chan Tai's farm, it's only a short walk to our goal, an open field outside a nearby Uyghur village. There's an annual festival that few outsiders have ever witnessed, the Uyghur horse races. The Uyghur are famous throughout China for their horses. They're larger and therefore faster than Tibetan or Mongolian ponies. For more than a thousand years, the emperor's army horses all came from here. Faster horses meant more success in battle. In those days, the annual race meeting was the testing ground for both horses and riders. Now it's mainly a social occasion, although competition is just as keen. Already the crowds are growing. It's a sign of the times that in daily life, horses have been largely replaced by motorbikes, which the local people call metal horses. There are only about 14,000 Uyghur all told, but most of them are gathered here today. They're a typical mixed Silk Road people. Their festival clothes reflect cultural backgrounds. Some are pure Uyghur, some more Tibetan in style, and some more Mongolian or Kyrgyz. Guo Chan Tai, who as well as livestock farmer, is also principal of the local school, is leading a group of his school children. The event begins with a parade. People have come from all over the region to take part, and each group has its own riders to support. Bringing up the rear of the parade, the stars of the day, the horses and their riders. Next, there's a dance display. The music may not be live, but it's Uyghur music. Nothing like the music of the majority Chinese population. After years of oppression, minorities like the Uyghur are now actively encouraged to keep hold of their traditions. Night has fallen, and the dancing continues. This is the great social opportunity of the year, when the Uyghur can meet old friends and make new ones, and even keep an eye out for potential marriage partners.
The next day sees the start of the serious business of the festival. Guo Chantai has a horse in the races, but in the enormous gathering, he's having a problem finding it. The first race is coming up. The track is water to try to keep the dust down, though it doesn't seem to work. The spectators support their own riders, but since gambling is illegal in all of mainland China, the main tensions are among the competitors. Guo has found his horse. He doesn't ride in the races anymore. He has a young rider to race his horse for him, but he's optimistic about his horse's chances. The first race gets underway. These are time trials for later races, and the horses don't gallop but trot. Though the pace seems none the slower for that. Guo's horse is through to the next round, but we won't be here to see it. The races go on for another four days, and we're moving on to the next leg of our walk. Tomorrow, the Great Wall takes us away from the cool mountain homeland of the Uyghur, and on to the most difficult section of the walk, in the burning heart of the Gobi Desert. Heading once more towards the Great Wall, we're facing our greatest challenge, the intense heat of the Gobi Desert. It's enough to test any walker's limits. Up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, even in late spring. But the air is clear and the setting stunning. And despite the discomforts, this is a rare, exhilarating chance to experience one of the most extreme places on the planet. The Great Wall is well preserved here and easy to follow, and it leads us steeply upwards into the nearby hills. Here, the wall has been built right across a valley, effectively blocking it. It's a reminder of why the wall was built, to keep out invaders. Here, they would have been horsemen from Central Asia, so-called barbarians, pouring down the valley from their homeland beyond. On the cliff face, there are some surprising carvings. They were probably made by those same horsemen around the time the wall was originally built. And they show large, deer-like animals, not what you'd expect in the middle of a desert. It's hard to understand why the invaders were so eager to conquer this arid expanse. But not far away lies the answer the most precious commodity in a desert region, an oasis. Without these pockets of water, no one could settle here, and even travel would be impossible. The wall put this oasis firmly on the Chinese side, out of reach of the attacking enemy. The wall looks different here, it's been restored by the Chinese government. On the neighboring section, a local farmer has taken things into his own hands. Virtually alone, Yang Yongfu has restored the towers and wall on an impressive scale. He and his small team use age-old methods that seem to defy modern building theory. It's still all done by hand. Logs pinned down with stone pegs and straw twists to form a frame. Soil brought uphill, then spread and watered down. Oh, oh. 
then tamp down to form a solid structure hard as rock. Finally, the logs are cut away to be reused, leaving a distinctive pattern on the surface of the wall. This was how thousands of miles of wall were built centuries ago, an astounding achievement. But now, Yang's work is threatened. There's a national debate about restoration policy on the wall. Current feeling is that this sort of comprehensive restoration is more like replacement, and that it hastens the destruction of the original. Yet as we've seen so often on this wall, left to itself, the wall inevitably falls into ruin. It's a dilemma as yet unresolved. Yang and his workers come from the village in the oasis below. Their houses are built of earth too. Over the centuries, they've used parts of the wall in their own houses, then repaired the wall when danger threatened. For them, the wall is part of their lives. Before continuing into the desert, we're going to take a break from the heat to visit a unique village in the foothills above. There's an unexpected welcome at the village of Chifang where our arrival has coincided with a festival. Visitors like us are automatically included with other guests, a rare chance to see a local event from the inside. In this poor desert land, it's an honor to be treated to such a feast. There's rice wine to be shared, The centerpiece is a whole lamb. The host, the mayor, chooses the best parts for the guests, including the eyeballs. But the reason we've come here lies beyond the village hall. In this valley is an explosion of Buddhist hill temples. There were once 365 of them, one for every day of the year. Now there are only 52, but the number is growing. After a period when religion was suppressed, it is now tolerated, and the government supports the temple reconstruction, led by the monk Di Yi and his wife Li Ying. Di Yi built his faith on his early upbringing. When he was very young, his mother practiced Buddhism in their home. He remembers that they had a statue of Buddha and burnt incense. As soon as he was free to practice his religion again, he went with some friends to a local quarry and began bringing back stone to rebuild the temples. He intends to carry on until all the temples have been rebuilt. The project is massive. Local monks, revitalized by the resurgence in Buddhist belief, are determined that the valley will once more be filled with hundreds of symbols of their faith. In a nearby cave, there's an astonishing sight a mass of statues, the 500 apprentices of Buddha. Monk Zhang Zhongyi knows each one and the personalities they represent. Each apprentice has a lesson to teach. This one is young, bright, energetic, but impulsive. 
He knows he must learn to think calmly and take life more seriously. This apprentice is older. He teaches that success or fortune can never be guaranteed. Life is filled with surprises. So he advises against spending life planning and scheming for advancement. These statues and the moral stories they tell have strong Chinese cultural overtones. It's an example of how Buddhism, an Indian religion, has been adapted for local needs. But there are many Buddhists in Qifang who follow the form of Buddhism practiced by their neighbors in Tibet. They go to the Wenshu Temple, where they revere this man, Dan Binima, who is believed to be blessed with divine power. The gods are thought to be very much alive here, and this ceremony is designed to bring divine life to a statue. It's a long, elaborate ceremony. Chanting induces a meditative state in the monks. The statue itself is believed to be transformed. In their words, it has its eyes open. Spiritually, it comes alive. Dan Binima wraps the statue and hands it to the man who has brought it to be blessed. When it is taken into his home, it will bring blessings and keep away harm. This cave behind the temple has a special significance for Dan Binima, who is himself believed to be an indirect reincarnation of the divine being, the Wenshu Pusa. And this cave is the grand hall where the Wenshu Buddha first appeared. Its mission was to help the people to enlightenment a mission that continues to this day. During the Chinese Cultural Revolution, many such caves were destroyed by government decree. This one was spared because it was useful as a food store. But all the old paintings were ruined. Only these fragments are left. In Dan Binima's private chambers, we're taken to see something extraordinary. These venerated objects are human relics, and only Dan Binima himself may touch them. The relics have been donated by relatives of the dead. They're used at funerals to help cleanse the spirit of the departed, and it's believed that the donors will earn extra merit in their next incarnations. This cup is made from the top half of the skull of a young woman who died in an accident. The leg bone has been turned into a ritual flute. This is the skin of an old man's hand and forearm. While this might seem shocking to outsiders, for Tibetan Buddhists, death, even early death, is a familiar part of life. Funerals here are important and powerful rituals. It may be that they offer comfort, a way of coping with the harsh realities of mountain life. Outside the temple, the day ends with the raising of flags. Their every movement speeding prayers to heaven. Their bright colors a constant reminder of the resurgence of faith that this valley represents. Tomorrow we leave this tranquil valley and return to the wall. We'll follow it to its end, what was once China's last outpost.
Today, we set out along the last arduous stretch of the Great Wall, passing statues of the wandering monk Zhuangzang and his group walking on towards India. But as we approach the city of Jiayuguan, the only camels we find are made of concrete. This is a modern industrial city. And here, just outside Jiayuguan, is the last fortress, the final outpost of Ming Dynasty China. This marks the end of the Great Wall. And as a tribute to its importance, the government has rebuilt the fort just as it once was. Beyond the end of the wall lie the mountains. Then outside China, now an integral part of it. The barrier, once so vital, is needed no longer. We followed the Great Wall along its toughest and most extraordinary section, which few visitors ever reach. But the wall has other moods as it snakes its way through China, and a walker could spend half a lifetime taking in all it has to offer. Before we leave China, we return to the wall outside Beijing to meet Zhou Wanping, one of the many whose lives have been shaped by this icon. He's passionate about the Great Wall and has spent his life photographing it. For him, as for many Chinese, the wall is more than an epic feat of engineering. He sees it as a great treasure, passed down through the generations. It represents the spirit of eternity. Yet the wall itself is not eternal. And in many places, while the conservation debate rages, it's slowly but inevitably falling into ruin. Zhou has no doubt that the wall should be preserved. For him, the reconstructed sections are not only valid, but essential. Walking along the wall has taken us on a journey, not only through some of the world's most stunning landscapes, but into the heart of China's identity. From its earliest struggles with would-be invaders to the economic miracle that has put modern cities in the desert. It's an unforgettable experience.